Welcome. I'm Judy Herman from Nurse Think, Nurse Tim, and I was the moderator last week when we talked about evidence-based and brain-based teaching. Today, we're going to take that information and morph it into how do I use what we know about the brain, what we know about learning to create or to modify strategies that foster clinical judgment in your class, clinical uh, discussions with your students, assignments, uh, hopefully, um, and that in and of itself could probably take a month. So we're going to really summarize. Please remember that these are actually presentations to present and kind of put forth our consensus reports. The consensus reports, if this is the first time you're attending one of these Brain to Bedside sessions, the consensus reports were written by a group of adventurous nurse educators with Nurse Think who were looking at the world around them. Some of our educators and integration specialists really have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in nursing education. All of us have educated at one time in various nursing environments. And we tried to look and pour through the literature and really use our own brain power to come up with what we thought could provide and inform nursing education as we do what our integration specialists love to call shifting the paradigm. And today we're gonna to talk about strategies that foster clinical judgment. Next, our objectives, we are gonna explore some of the strategies that support learning and mastering clinical judgment. Please know that the sky is the limit with this. Um, I used to call these creative teaching strategies. Some of you may remember when creativity and, and uh, we were trying to engage our students and we thought that creative strategies would maybe get them to actually listen to us and, and maybe start internalizing. But really, NCSBN has given us the charge to say that it's not only about being creative, but we need to come up with strategies that really help students master clinical judgment. Because as Erica told us on week one, our students have not mastered clinical judgment. They are in the clinical area and perhaps... Um, putting patients at risk because of that lack of clinical judgment. We are going to talk about, and this was a real deliberate conversation among the nurse educators, as we look at best practices in teaching, bringing forth a lot of those evidence-based principles that we talked about last week, but also tying it in with what we know about learning, the science of learning, and then also with the NCSBN clinical judgment measurement model. And that really is what this consensus uh, report does. We are not going to go over every strategy. Um, should you leave today's session and decide, hey, she never talked about this, I don't know what this strategy is, please feel free to email us at help at nursethink.com and they will forward it to one of us and we will explain it. Um, we are trying to practice what we preach here, even though last week I did an awful lot of talking and I probably will do that again today, but we really want to make sure that this is not simply um, just one more lecture that you listen to, you eat your lunch, and then you put it on a shelf. We want to make sure that you change your practice, and so we will be asking you to identify some practice changes that you can implement this week. So why? Why do we need to know this? So I want to just talk a little bit about the fact that we don't just talk about brain science and then leave it on a shelf. Again, brain science is about thinking about learning. And as we talked about last week, the technology, our ability to investigate the brain has really come such a long way in the last several decades that now we need to make sure that our strategies align with what we know about the brain. So you may remember, if you were with us last week, we discussed a principle called elaboration. Several of our nurse think strategies are based on elaboration. Why? Because we know that it is based in brain science. And so when we talk about elaboration, you may remember, and for those of you that weren't here, it's about layering. It's about reflection. It's about creating a way for students to see concepts, principles, um, ideas from several different perspectives and create multiple layers within their brain as they investigate that information. And then and you may remember the term transference, 
transfer that information to the next time they need it. So the next time they retrieve that information, how are they going to apply it to this new context? You remember that context is a word that we we use an awful lot. And how are they going to make sure that their that valid information is retrievable and then able to be applied at the bedside? And you know, we all know that Tanner's been telling us for Gosh, is it 32 years, right? Well, no, 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 12 years. Sorry, we're not that bad. Um, but it's 12 years. <laughs> Sorry, math. Mm. Um, and I teach pharmacology. Anyway, um, it, she has been talking since the Carnegie Report in 2010 about our need to apply. And we still are grappling with that. We also talked a lot about effort and rigor. And we mentioned, and I think this probably deserves to be mentioned every single time, that we need to get away from the idea that we as nurse faculty put in all the hard work so that we can make learning easy for our students. And instead we need to help and create rigor so that the students are doing the hard work of learning. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be easy. People um, frequently tell me, you know, I, I'm just not creative. I don't have, you know, I'm not able to just think on my feet. You will get better and it will grow. And it's like every other skill, as you practice it more, as you get more comfy in that classroom, you'll all of a sudden say, you know what, guys, Let's talk about this. Let's really delve in deeper. And then we're going to do a couple of the strategies that we'll we'll talk to you over the next hour or so. So we also know that there's an element of maturity and brain development. And so as we think about this, sometimes one of the greatest challenges is the realization that every brain in your classroom is just a wee bit different. But that doesn't put all that responsibility on you. And so it is so critical that we let our students know why we are doing assignments. I remember having a student coming to me and say, you know, Dr. Herman, I don't think this is a very good assignment. And I, I remember looking at him and thinking, I don't care. But no, that's not what I said to him. I said, okay, let me talk to you about what my experience has been teaching students about this information. And then how they have learned it and been successful later. Now, I'm not saying he then embraced that assignment with a whole heart. I mean, I, I do believe he didn't like it because it was a hard assignment and a lot of work, but our discussion really revolved around how it will help you learn your objectives, meet your outcomes. And that's really what we're talking about. How do we meet those outcomes of clinical judgment? So I'd like you to look at the picture um, and I'd like you to think a little about what we know about this already. What do we know about teaching clinical judgment? And I'm gonna use a story that was um, told to me by Dorothy Del Bueno. Now, some of you may recognize Dorothy's um, name because Dorothy actually was one of the first originators of some of the science on critical thinking. And if you read the Kavanaugh article, which I feel like I quote almost daily, the Kavanaugh article talks about using Del Bueno's tools. And she happened to be from Philadelphia near where I, I am. So she would tell this, sto this story similar to just like this student. So the student is getting this patient out of bed. And Dorothy believed that clinical judgment, and she used the terms clinical judgment and critical thinking, both, um, she said clinical judgment is really knowing when to dot, dot, dot. Okay, so I'll tell this story and, and see if this rings true to you. So this, let's say this is a nursing student. You're standing maybe in back out of the picture and you are watching this student get this client out of bed. And the minute the client stands straight, he begins to urinate on the student's foot. And the student looks at you, the nursing faculty, and says, what do I do? And you as a faculty, Dorothy contends, this is how what happened to her. Uh, Dorothy contends that her response was to the student, move your foot. And so some of clinical judgment is common sense. It is knowing when to move your foot. It is knowing when to take the information and actually synthesize it to how am I going to use it in this concept, in this context. One of the things they talk about in nursing history, and I know that, you know, many, maybe not enough, but maybe what, 11 to 13% of the nursing population is now male. 
But one of the things they talked about nursing education in the early parts of our history was that we took women and turned them into girls, meaning we took thinking, breathing human beings who had a lot of common sense and a lot of world background. And we took you into an organization and into a framework and into a mindset where there was one way to do everything. There was a right way and a wrong way. And the straightness of your seams of your stockings was really a priority. So we don't mean to do that in our education. So again, maturity is going to be a lot of this. But what we want to think about is knowing when to. And so learning is so closely attributed to clinical judgment. The NCSBN has given us this model and probably my biggest suggestion, and I believe my educators that are here, our educators that are with us here, my teammates will, uh, will underline this, is that probably the best thing you can do after today is use the words cues, solutions, outcomes, actions, every day in class with your students. You know, sometimes we try and teach them a different language and, and there's been a little bit of criticism about the NCSBN coming out with just one more model that we have to look at. But this speaks to science, right? Prioritizing hypotheses. What do you think is going on here? We need to be using these words. So if you do nothing else after today, we need to think about using these words. The second thing, and I believe We've said it every week, but please go to the NCSBN website. One of the things that NCSBN has created is a compendium of information for us. There's an article. They started with the science, with where they should, with a review of the literature. And they had a non-nurse. It was Bill Muntean. He actually did the review of the literature about learning and clinical judgment. And there is a, I don't know, probably a 20-page article, the most comprehensive look at nursing knowledge that we've seen in a long time is on their website. Print that out. I'm still a printer. Okay, so save it to your desktop. But make sure that you spend time looking at the science. What rings true to you? And in fact, many schools are really adding clinical judgment to their outcomes, to their philosophies, because this is what the accrediting bodies are going to look at. And the accrediting bodies do it because that's sound science, right? We need to make sure that all these teaching strategies are contributing to positive outcomes in our students. All right, so let's get to a little bit of strategies. I, meant to, I mentioned early on that elaboration is probably one of my favorite brain-based uh, learning concepts. The idea that we want students to dig deeper into every single thing we have them do. So we're actually going to give you, show you a couple of the brain-based strategies we have incorporated into our entire philosophy. They started out being talked about in the review preview. Now, Kimmy, Sarah, and Erica bring them to every school. We remind our students about this, and it's called safe studying. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'll tell you what S and F are, but we're going to spend most of our time with A and E. S is study what you don't know. A very wise person once told me, we tend to study what we like and we're good at. And remember what we talked about last week, our brain loves to be brilliant. Our brain does not feel comfy when someone tells us we don't know something. And so we need students to understand that they can't sit around and do quizzing apps and feel happy with what they're doing and stop there. The idea is that they need to take those weaknesses and put them on their laundry list. And I'm pretty sure that Sarah is going to talk about your laundry list next week in the power of remediation. But anyway, the laundry list is what do I not, not know? What do I need to look up? What do I need to talk to my buddies about? What do I need to really don't get it? Talk to my professor about. Anyway, so that's what study what you don't know is S. F is 50, 100. And that's really... Remember last week we talked about spaced retrieval and calibration. So spaced retrieval is the fact that you need to revisit information frequently. Calibration is a great way to learn what you don't know. So we frequently have students that come into our classroom saying, and I told the story last week, won't retell it. They come in saying they know it and then they fail our exams. And it's because our exam is is wrong, right? It's because they're not calibrating well. They're not assessing their own knowledge. And it all goes back to our brain and survival. We need to help them override those messages and say, yeah, but we want your brain to be smarter. We want your brain to be better. We want your brain to be safe. 
in patient care. So the two strategies are A, ask three. Every single time they confront a concept, a question, a case, something that puzzles them, something that they've mastered, something that um, a colleague brings up in post-conference, encounter everything, ask three questions. And sometimes students say, I don't know what to ask. A great question is the why question, right? Why is that the right answer? Why is this answer wrong? Because I really thought this wrong answer was the one. I'm pretty sure that I saw it in three other exam questions that looked exactly like this one. They don't always see the nuances, right? And ask why, ask why. That's actually a kind of a tricky way to trick your brain into deeper thought, right? You go from superficial to deep by just asking questions why. We also tell students to do E3, expand every event. So I, we, in our preview review, one of the stories we tell the students is, you're standing at the bedside of a client and the nurse is giving and uh, infusing a nasogastric tube feeding. And about a quarter of the way into the feeding, the patient starts coughing violently. So, and that's all you tell them, right? Coughing violently. So what you want them to do is write down at least three words. I, we'd prefer three phrases that ask them to think about expanding that event. We all don't have to have watched a patient aspirate to know what is going on, what are the complications associated. We may have all taken care of somebody with pneumonia, uh, aspiration pneumonia. You know, I remember taking care of a little boy who eight ounces of formula went into his right upper lobe at home. And um, they thought the coughing was that, that they, he was just gagging because the tube was in his mouth, right? And, you know, so it took a lot to clean that little guy's lungs up, right? Um, but how do we use the power of reflection, right? Remember that every time we do this, we are creating that long-term potentiation that we talked about last week that's creating another pathway in the brain so that to retrieve it will be faster. And when we look at that, that information is more likely to be remembered and filed correctly. So you can use A, tell your students to ask three. You can use this when you stand in front of them in class. You have just given a 20-minute class hopefully no more than 20 minutes, right? And you're about to go into a clinical judgment reinforcer. And so you're going to say, expand this event, give them one sentence, postpartum client, you walk in and there's at least a hundred milliliters of blood in the blue pad under the client's buttocks, expand that event, right? Every way you can, every 10 minutes in class, try and get students to reflect and elaborate. All right, the second thing we're gonna talk a little bit about, we spent a lot of time talking about sleep last week um, and talking about why sleep is so important. So we file our memories while we sleep, we clear our hippocampus. So all those memories can go to our prefrontal or our what, what brain scientists like to call our neocortex, that new cortex that's developing every day. We also tag things that are important while we sleep. So a great strategy to tell your students is rather than scrolling social media or playing some game where civilizations are annihilated, they could spend 20 minutes talk, thinking about what went on that was important today in class. What were the things that we learned about that were critical? What did the instructor talk about three times? What did the instructor do clinical judgment learning exercises with? What did we have assignments about that I in inferred were busy work, but now I'm kind of thinking they reinforced my own clinical judgment skills. Spend 20 minutes doing that. Great research says that that enhances our ability to tag it as important, that we may be able to retrieve it a little better, and then the whole concept of interleaving, the idea that we're going to interrupt forgetting of that information. All right, so we're going to do a strategy that I think probably all of us have talked a little bit about, and it's that whole idea of compare and contrast. And I found these, these uh, illustrations a little bit um, hokey looking, but put them in anyway. So the idea is that we've got our working memory and look at like, are we overwhelmed with that pile of memories, right? We just have so much going on in that hippocampus. But at the top, we start storing them in the file drawers in our brain, in our neocortex 
according to similarities. So we're going to be putting things. So let's say we're taking care of a client and we're talking to our students, I should say, about acute and chronic renal failure. Right. And students are starting to think about what are the things that are similar between the two? At what point is kidney function reduced? Uh, what is the pathophysiology? What might be similar in their treatments? And we start storing them in different filing cabinets within our neocortex. But then let's say the exam comes and they haven't even addressed that information three weeks later. Um, maybe they looked at their PowerPoints the night before. When they start retrieving that information, they start retrieving it by differences. They start thinking about, so when does the anuria begin with chronic versus acute renal failure? What are the pathophysiological differences? How do I understand this? What might be different in the treatment, short or long-term? And that's how they retrieve. So I would say if you do nothing else, except maybe use the words from the clinical judgment measurement model, another one you want to use is compare and contrast. Use it every day in clinical. Use it every day in post-conference. You're tired too at the end of a, a busy clinical day. So sit down in post-conference and say, all right, everybody, I want you to spend five minutes thinking about how your client, hopefully maybe two clients, were similar and different, and then compare them to last week. I did this with my students. It was amazing how all of us had to sit there and really like reprogram, like who did I take care of last week? Like it was ancient history, right? I'd pull out my assignment sheets from the week before. Oh, you had Johnny. Okay, all right. This was what Johnny uh, had. And, and oh, that, uh, you know, helped certainly. They started retrieving that different information. We know that brain analysts call this brain hugging. It's, 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 it's actually providing affection to your brain. It's allowing your brain to chunk. And we mentioned chunking a little bit last week. There's another word that we also use is scaffolding. Uh, it's another word sometimes they'll call. That's the platform upon which we build uh, transferring information into new situations. So you build old knowledge onto new context. So you knew about just, you know, type one diabetes. Now you have a woman who is pregnant with type one diabetes. So how are you going to build that compare and contrast? Really important to do that. Whether you come up with this little worksheet, one of the schools that I had worked with was an iPad school. So they actually created like a, a little form within their Google Docs or somebody's Docs that they were able to then do compare and contrast. And then they sent it to each other in post-conference. So there's a lot of different ways that you can use this. I heard a lot of information last week in the chat about the mindset issue, and by no means do I have the time because I really want to make sure we get to the, a lot of the more specific strategies, but just know that when someone has a fixed mindset, and I'm sure that Sarah will talk a little bit more about this as we talk about remediation, because people with fixed mindsets don't like to remediate, right? They're already fine as they are. They fear failure and they avoid challenges because again, that just reinforces to their brain that they're not as fabulous as they thought they were. Um, one of the things that I think we mentioned last week is that we really need to help our fixed mindset students understand that we are all growing constantly. I am constantly amazed at how much I don't know, right? And how much I need to study up on stuff. And maybe I knew it at one time, but gosh, I don't know that I can retrieve it, right? That's that gross mindset. And again, we all have growth mindsets in different areas. Um, we know that that growth mindset is willing to kind of have that power of not yet and um, that they really are working to improve their own competence. And in fact, one of the things I've tried to put into practice in my personal life is we don't want to praise people for being intelligent. We want to praise them for the amount of work and effort they put in. And many of us remember a day, and I know my students talked about this and I talk about, it, I'm still friends with the girl that I swear never studied much in nursing school. I was not that girl. Okay. I was the girl that would sit there and study while she went on dates. Anyway, she's a nurse. I'm a nurse. We're both doing well, but I will say that it didn't come easily for me, especially the sciences. I really had to work hard in, in uh, nursing school. So the idea is that we want to praise people for, wow, you put a lot of work into this. Like, look at this study sheet that you came up for yourself and you really, you know, did a, a really good job. A couple more pieces of information as we look at that is just thinking about how we can approach our students. So I'm sure this never happened to you, but happened to me a zillion times. 
So several students in class become angry while you're trying to explain a difficult concept. The students start to withdraw from learning, one saying, you aren't teaching this right. And in other states, if you taught this better, we would get it, right? Um, so if you could spend a minute, just type in the chat, what would you do in this situation? It could be a statement. It could be an approach. How would you address this classroom of fixed mindset students? And I'll give you a minute to do that. Yeah. Okay, Janine, good job. Time for a 10 minute break. Yes. Okay, ask them come on. Oh, and teach it. Wow, Calliope, there you go. Take a break, explain the information, have another student try. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the students can put it into words. Yeah. What is your muddiest point? Very good, Kia. Yeah, thanks. Okay, how I could be more helpful. Good job. Share what they understand. Teach back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ask them what they're missing and how can I help? Acknowledge the feelings. Yeah. You know, it's very important that, um, you know, sometimes we realize that, uh, you know, one of the things I always say is that, you know, I pretty much after 27 times had pharmacology down. Well, of course I did. Like, I, I think a gerbil would, right? Like, so we need to really think about the fact that this is the first time they're learning this information. And yeah, you can do hard things, Kia. I like that. Yeah. So, but I do think it's important to not become defensive, right? Which is our human nature, especially in front of a crowd, the mob mentality can kind of really make us feel very vulnerable. And again, remember our brain's all about survival, but we really need to step back, take the high road on this. And you guys really came up uh, with some great strategies. I think if I, I, if I had the wherewithal and this was happening, I think I would use a bunch of what you guys came up with, break the students into groups and get them to talk to each other about what they understand about this concept thus far, and then really get a good idea. You know, I have heard strat fellow faculty who will say things like, well, if you had done the reading last night, you would understand it better. And let me just say that that never works out well for any of us. All right. It may be true. I'm not saying it's not true. But it, it, it's important that we come up with a new strategy. And yes, it may be that you're going to actually come back next week or good job. Yeah. Yeah. Break it into pieces, groups, have them presented in class. Great. What we do is hard, right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it is important for us to think about the fact that teaching strategies can really foster this accurate self-reflection. And it can also give students the idea that, oh, that's what a growth mindset is, right? Again, we don't have to keep this a secret from our students. We can tell them what a growth mindset is and talk to them about it. All right. So a strategy. Um, I'd like you all, if you have, and Sarah, maybe you could put the um, consensus report from today in the chat, just so if they want to look at it, if they haven't downloaded it. But one of the things that I believe is the easiest thing, but the hardest thing is the Socratic questioning, is the ability to close our own mouths sometimes and ask the hard questions, right? And to really pause and take a minute. Um, if you're type A like me and East Coast, New York City, I remember somebody saying, count to 15 after you ask a question. And I'm like, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. And by three Mississippi, I'm ready to freak out, right? Because that's just too much time. I can't possibly give them 15 seconds. Now I have gotten a little better, but not much. But what we want to think about is giving your students voice to allow your students to engage in clinical ju judgment as a habit. I'm not sure if Kimmy's the first person to say it, but she's the first person I heard say it is all about that clinical judgment muscle, right? It's a muscle that needs to be worked, probably came from any of the colleagues that are on this call. But the idea is that by asking them purposeful questions, they're going to do that metacognition and they're going to start thinking about uh, thinking 
right? We also know that the Socratic questioning is a great classroom assessment strategy. One of our problems in nursing education is we bang through information. Our classrooms can be somewhat large and we make assumptions about our classroom. That's why that muddiest point and that muddiest idea is so important. What we need to think about is that those questions need to be just like our exam questions. They need to be higher level questions. We can't say, do you think this patient will survive? Okay, yes or no, and then they're done. I remember in clinical, I would say, are you doing okay? Well, of course they're gonna be doing okay. Why? Because if they tell me they're not doing okay, that's gonna go on their evaluation. Or they don't even know if they're okay or not, but they haven't killed anybody yet. So they're thinking they're doing fine. When in fact, maybe, you know, I need to dig a little bit deeper. We can make some of these slides available to you, but I would encourage you to just take a picture if you'd like to have it. But it's just some examples of what are some of the questions you can ask. What if? What if you go into a room and you find your client's IV disconnected? What if you go into a room and you find your client's side rails down? Maybe a good reason for that, right? What would you have done differently? So often our students think that that is a way of kind of getting them at what they did wrong, when in fact, it's one of the highest levels of, of clinical judgment is being able to evaluate and then regroup. What interventions do you anticipate today? What equipment do you need? Many of us that have certainly been in clinical know that sometimes students are in and out of the room 10 times getting the equipment just to do vital signs. What complications do you anticipate? One of the strengths of our nurse think materials is really looking at complications because we know that students need to know them in order to prevent them and monitor for them. Very important. All right. So Another strategy that we use a lot at Nurse Think is getting carded. And Tim describes this with the high tech uh, study um, equipment that is the index card. Okay, so this index card, pretty much available. You can go for the white, or you could go for the fluorescent colors, perhaps, or you can have the students buy their own index cards. But these are two exercises that we've incorporated into some of our nurse think materials. But I encourage you to think about all the different things you could do with an index card. So first, let me talk about the value of the index card, right? The index card is they're writing, right? They're elaborating. They're asking why. They're asking three questions. They are using this as a memory trigger. So anytime you're in class, and let's say they're starting to see that kind of the, the, the um, glazed over look, right? Guys, get out your index cards, right? Let's get out your index cards. Bring a pack with you to every class for the students that dog ate their index cards. There's going to be one, right? So, and then just say, okay, so we're looking at this client. We've, we're taking them to the bedside in the classroom. And then we say, come up with three lab values that would indicate your client is deteriorating, right? And then get up and find somebody else in the classroom and look at theirs and get somebody else and look at theirs. And then let's discuss it. What I think is amazing about these getting carded is that it takes 10 times more time to think about it than actually do it. And we always worry about degrading from our class time. Oh, I, you know, I got so much to cover. Well, you know, we all know what that is. We we don't need to cover it all. But anyway, that being said, the idea is this is a deep dive into very important concepts. Now, what that means is you have to select important stuff that you want your students to be writing on their index cards. Tell them to bring their index cards to clinical. Communicate to your clinical faculty. Take out your index cards while in clinical. And in post-conference, we're going to talk about comparing and contrasting what you wrote on your card for your client in class to the client you're taking care of here in clinical. Remember, we want to blur those boundaries between the different learning fora and get them to see that the class is clinical, clinical is class. Tim has students do this and has people texting each other, right? Just they love their phones. This allows them to touch their phones and not feel like they've been away for their phone too long. You can have them Google it on their phone, right? You can look it up in lab books, depending on what you have people bring to class. It is important that you just, you know, think about how you can make these index cards valuable. 
I worked with a school that wrote down the um, NCLEX client needs, a different NCLEX client need on each of the eight cards and had the students, okay, everybody pull out your pharmacological and parenteral therapies card, write down three things we talked in class that could be a question that related to farm, right? Again, they're writing, they're active, they're engaged, they're thinking, they're elaborating, they're a little bit of spaced retrieval, they're interleaving, all of those things are brain-based. All right, so now I'm gonna ask you, we've got like 20 minutes left. Now I'm gonna ask you to bring out your consensus statement and you'll see that we came up with this chart. This chart actually evolved from some classes we were doing probably a year or two, well, pre-COVID, so 19, can't say a year or two ago anymore, it's three years. Um, but what we were doing is we were talking early on about this NCSBN layer three, remember layer three with those six steps. And we were thinking, so what strategies really help with those steps? But then we wanted to make sure that it wasn't simply, well, this strategy is for recognizing cues, because to be quite honest with you, the whole point of the clinical judgment measurement model is not to see it as linear, but to see it as circular so that you're constantly re revisiting. And we use the word a lot, reassessing, right? We're constantly coming back. But then we're also going to think about how can I use cases that some of them will take them through all six steps and some of them will really focus on some steps better than others. So then we developed uh, the teaching strategies that were kind of wrapped around, and we looked at what principles of learning, some of this we talked about last week, the sensing, or some people call it noticing. And then, you know, obviously we have the interpretation, the responding, and the reflection, and that's that Tanner model of learning. So these are just a couple of strategies. Again, I'm just going to go over a couple of them. We already talked about Socratic questioning unfolding contextual cases. This is not really a specific strategy, but it's what you want to make sure you are doing in the classroom all the time, right? You are going to have cases that unfold. You are going to have cases that are based on context. You want to mention things like, so you're taking care of this client. And by the way, you have five other clients today and two have to go to surgery. Okay. And so pre-op holding will call you when it's time to, to finish up the checklist and transport the client. And both of your clients require RN transport to the pre-op holding area. Okay. So give them that context because they don't have endless amounts of time. I remember when I first started teaching fundamentals, and it was 90 minutes that these two students had taken to do the occupied bed with each other, right? And I remember thinking, you know, here I am still working on an open heart unit where we had fitted sheets. You know, I mean, the babies just move them from one side of the bed to the other. That's how I learned to do occupied bed, you know. But anyway, that's not true for all of us. But they were taking 45 minutes each to make these beds, right? Right. That's so unrealistic. Obviously, they were early on in their program, but we need to create some time pressure. We need to have interruptions. We need to have context, right? Another strategy that you might want to think about is assessment grand rounds. So obviously, this might be best working in a clinical area, but remember, you can always take four or five different case studies within your classroom that have different assessments of a concept you're talking about or a, maybe a set of disease processes. So let's just say we're talking about perfusion, come up with five different clients in class or five different clients that you see in the clinical area. With the patient's permission, you can go to the bedside. Now, COVID may have limited some of this. So what you can do in post-conference is have the students do the perfusion assessment of their own clients and share it in grand rounds, right? But what we want to do is start to get students to see recognizing cues, right? So often, you know, we've all experienced the student that's so focused on that task orientation that when you go in and ask them what color were your patient's lips, they have no clue. When you ask them if they had a pulse oximeter on, they may know that, but when you ask them what the number was, they may or may not have noted that because that wasn't something that they were told to do, right? That that grand survey of the room, that grand survey of a of a case in class really needs to be taught. So assessment grand rounds might help. 
Clinical judgment decision-making exercises. Again, nothing magical about this, but let's say you're finding that your students are not preparing incredibly a lot for class. Come up with five or six statements that you can say, there will be a quiz when you start class based on these five or six statements. So maybe you're gonna come up with, you are caring for a client with gastroesophageal reflux disease. The client has had a worsening of symptoms that brought him to the clinic. What behaviors might the client have engaged in that would cause that deterioration of his symptoms, right? Now you can obviously develop a quiz on that one, right? Come up with questions so that at least the students can come in and hit the floor running. Because frequently our students are just, they, you know, they think just coming to class, showing up in the seat is what they need to do. And they need to have some fertile ground, some foundation upon which they can build with your clinical judgment, with the exercises and the other things that we're gonna do in class. So clinical puzzle, this is actually one of my favorite ones. Go to those stores that sell everything for a dollar, right? And um, get a puzzle with the number of pieces of your clinical group. Now you can also do this in a simulation lab, in a debriefing post-simulation. And what you'll do is you'll say, everybody has the same client, but you're all collecting a different piece of the puzzle. So let's say one person's collecting the cues associated with the client's history. One person is selecting, is assessing the physical assessment cues. One is doing maybe the laboratory and diagnostic cues. They're all going to collect those cues. And then they take those cues and they bring them to post-conference or your lab debriefing. And they put together these as a puzzle. Now, one of the things that's amazing about the strategy, and you can use it any way you want it, is that they start seeing the holism. They start seeing how, wait, that lab data, now I understand why the patient's so tachypneic because their red blood cell count's so low and they're anemic, right? So they're starting to putting together. So it not only helps them recognize cues, but you see it kind of helps them analyze cues. And then you could take it the step further as you start thinking about what might be going on here. How can we prioritize hypotheses and take them through the whole model? Another strategy you might want to think about is think pair share. Again, didn't invent this. It's been in the literature for years. But remember that think pair share means that they're talking, you're not. And that is so critical. I taught really large classes. I think my record was 276. And I will tell you that it's really hard to get creative, but not impossible, not impossible to get creative with that large of a class. So I found that think, pair, share from day one was my most critical strategy, because what it meant was they started seeing that, that they had to engage in the material. Were there always 20 students who were not really engaging? could be. I tried to give them the hairy eyeball. I tried to do what I needed to do. I would even call them on them a little bit. But, you know, but the idea is that at least I think I was hitting maybe 250 at a time. You know, the idea is that they either think about it, pair up and share it with each other, or they literally think and pair and the pairing is part of the thinking. So you can really do it two ways. Now, in that large of a classroom, I couldn't have them share it with the larger group. I mean, maybe a couple of them could, but certainly everyone couldn't share. So the sharing at that large of a classroom is happening on that dyad level, but then certainly getting some ideas from maybe a couple and really randomizing and making sure I walked around the room to get everybody thinking about it. What you find is that this is when you can also bring in your ask three, right? What are three questions that you want to build on this? How would you elaborate this event, the E3, elaborate e this event? Very important. You could also simply use maybe in smaller classrooms or classrooms that uh, are a little more intimate, perhaps, the let's discuss trigger. Because one of the things that happens is that students are really happy listening to you. And frequently, our ego is very happy just talking. But we may be talking to a classroom that's that's not engaging in clinical judgment and maybe is struggling with what we're talking about, right? And so we stop, we pause, let's discuss. 
Again, you guys had fabulous strategies that came up here with looking at how do we kind of derail for a minute, right? And make sure that we're actually making progress rather than plowing through with just the trigger words like, let's discuss it. Where have I lost you? What can I do to help you? You know, and remember, they may not know where they got lost and they may not know how you can help, but then you can say, all right, let's take a break or we'll revisit this again next week or whatever other strategies you came up with. And then film clips and thinking questions. So we know that this is a generation that has been raised that you don't ice a cake or file your nails without checking YouTube first, right? We know that and we need to embrace that. And in fact, I have gotten to be one of those people. It took me a little while. I was a slow adopter of YouTube and now I love YouTube, right? And so I think I can say that, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Hey, our, we have a YouTube channel, so I guess I can say it. The idea is, is that any clips that you show in class, make sure that you have thinking questions, right? Thinking questions, make them, don't have them watch it. And then they kind of sit there and think they're on vacation, right? They're, oh, we're watching a video. Where's the popcorn? You know, no, it's, we need to look at this and really think about, you come up with a couple of questions. You can post them on the whiteboard, post them on the PowerPoints, go to the film clip. YouTube has made it easy. And then show them the clip, whether it's in class or at home, and then have them answer the thinking questions. Make sure they're outcome based. Make sure it's not you're not just showing it to them for fun. It's it's very much based on what your objectives are and your outcomes. Have them make clinical judgment decisions. What equipment would you need to care for that client if that's a client you're taking care of? What complications? Go back to what our Socratic questioning is and have them really thinking. I hope that you've gotten the idea that thus far, none of these strategies are magic. None of them are patented. Everything can be stolen. Everything can be morphed. Everything can be shared. That's a nicer word, isn't it? Shared. It's about you knowing your classroom, knowing your students, and knowing yourself, your own comfort level. You know, some material we are so much more comfortable teaching than others, right? And we love to teach that stuff that we know and we're good at, and that's our craft. And then someone tells you that you have to teach something that's not in your forte, and that always is a little bit hard. But remember that these strategies will help you develop your clinical judgment skills in those areas too. We are all evolving. We're all growing and changing. <laughs>